Hi, my name is Leslie Villegas. I'm a senior policy analyst on the pre-K-12 education policy team at New America. I'm part of our English learner team, which focuses on improving the policies and practices that shape the educational experiences of students identified as English learners or ELs as we refer to them often. Our work focuses on making sure that these students are not sidelined in education and are prepared to be active and engaged civic participants. This conversation is the first of a series focused on the 50th anniversary of the US Supreme Court case of 1974, Lau versus Nichols, which enshrined in law that ELs must be provided with the, the necessary services to quote, fully participate in their education, regardless of their home language. The class action case was brought forth on behalf of 1800 Cantonese speaking students from Chinese backgrounds enrolled in San Francisco Unified School District in California, who were not being provided supplemental language instruction. The plaintiffs argued that without the appropriate linguistic supports, these students could not reasonably access equal educational opportunities that they were entitled to under the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause and the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibits discrimination based on race, color, or national origin. The provisions of law require that every school district serving EL classified students have their own plan to ensure these students have meaningful access to the district's educational program. Today, students classified as ELs represent roughly 10% of the K through 12 population at around 5 million students. For those watching today, I'm joined by Patricia Morita Mullaney, Associate Professor of Literacy and Language at Purdue University. Trish is a licensed K through 12 teacher, coach and administrator and has taught and led EL educa adult education, middle and elementary school. She served as part past president of the Indiana chapter for teachers of English to speakers of other languages. Her research focuses on the intersection between language learning, gender and race and how this informs the identity and acts of educators of bilingual students. Guided by critical and feminist thought, she examines how these overlapping identities inform the logics of educational decision-making for bilingual students. Thank you for being here, Trish. Um, so, I so I would just like to start off by asking you to share how you got started in this issue area, mainly you know, bilingual education, literacy, and civil rights for students identified as ELs, and what your connection to Lau versus Nichols is. Sure. So thanks, Leslie. Um, for me, it is deeply personal. Um, I identify as Japanese American third generation and my own immigrant past with my grandparents coming from Japan and my father and his siblings being incarcerated during World War II in Japanese internment or what we reference as Japanese imprisonment camps um, during World War II. Um, Dad was really encouraged to uh, evacuate his Japanese very quickly. That was done so in the schools that he attended at camp called Americanization camps. And so we saw very quickly that Japanese could not be used as an instrumental tool in him accessing what was happening in the classroom. And that's the case for his other siblings as well. And so for me, who does not really have working proficiency in Japanese, you can see this dramatic uh, language shift. So for me, um, knowing that my dad and his siblings didn't have that as an instrumental tool and how it contributed to the language loss that they collectively experienced, um, which was passed on to future generations, um, we can see the impact of um, getting rid of the language. Um, the first language, the native language of children, can have a long-term impact um, on how people feel about themselves, how they feel about their languages and their histories. It is an effort to, um, a, an effort of erasure that is something that's really specific to the AAPI identifying communities. So for me, it is deeply personal in that way. Also formally as a bilingual and an ESL teacher, I think about the students who spoke many different languages and how they use those languages in my classrooms to access content and how I didn't have a prohibition um, upon that language use. 
whereas the rest of the school may have felt really differently about it. So for me, it is personal, professional, and it maps directly onto my identity, the identity of my family members and the identity of my students. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And I feel like a lot of people who work in this space do have that personal connection, either through personal experience or their families of having to deal with this type of discrimination in the education system and in just America as a whole. Um, so it is it is very common to come at this work in from like a very passionate and personal perspective. Um, and so what is your connection to Lau versus Nichols specifically? Um, through the work that you've done and you know your decision to 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 work in to focus on that topic. Sure. So my research does focus on uh, really how identities get mapped into how policies are arbitrated. Um, policies might state something very clearly, but then how it happens on the ground is driven by. Um, individual identities. And I very, very specifically focus on what that means for the identities of the teachers that work with multilingual students, multilingual students themselves, um, parents. So I'm drawn to understanding policy from the first person perspective of the people that are actually um, developing it, but also those that are implementing it and enacting it, because it may um, follow a different spirit, depending on who is inhabiting that policy space. Um, I'm originally from California. I was born in San Francisco. I spent a couple summers working in Chinatown. And so this goes back in time. I also had a lot of high school classmates who were Chinese American and spent a lot of time in Chinatown um, on the weekends attending uh, Chinese uh, uh, community-based schools or, or attending church or community events in the city. Um, and so you know, my affiliation with my Chinese American friends over the years have contributed to my continued curiosity with Chinatown and how things uh, continue to operate, operate there um, and how it's a really, really distinct um, and beautiful place. Um, and then really one of the things that really drew me in is I think it was in 2015, I was at AERA in San Francisco and they had a panel on Lao and Edward Steinem, who was the lead lawyer of Lau v. Nichols um, and was, you know, the lawyer in charge of the plaintiffs, Lau and the other um, 12 plaintiffs, um, the Cantonese families. And he said, this really should have been Lopez versus Nichols. And I was really captivated by that. And there wasn't much more said about this other than there were more Latinos than there were Cantonese speaking Chinese in San Francisco at the time. And so, um, you know, the argument was more about there's more Latinos. And so I was really intrigued by this. So in the summer of 2019, I emailed and phoned up Edward Stein, Steinem to say, I want to know more about this. From there, he said, did you know that Alan Nichols lives up the street from your dad? And did, do you know that I know the first uh, teacher of Kinney Lau? And from there, I was introduced to these different characters. And as I um, came to know different Chinese American teachers and activists, they introduced me to their friends, introduced me to other architects within Lao, and it just snowballed from there. So this has really been a lifelong journey around language rights, um, but specifically, I began earnestly um, investigating this in, in 2019. Wow, that is uh, pretty cool that you're able, that that you're able to center yourself in that community and learn from for first person really first person research uh, from the people who are involved. I think that that's really rare um, in the policy space and the civil rights space. So I think that that is. Uh, a really uh, interesting perspective. And we'll get to the work that you're doing on that um, later as well. Um, but just focusing on Lao for now, what is the significance of this case in the broader fabric of civil rights for students whose first language is not English? Sure. So as, as we know, or, or perhaps maybe we don't know, I'm, I'm learning that um, this is not broadly understood. 
But um, Edward Steinem, in the original case that he filed in March of 1970, he said that the lack of um, provision of a specialized teacher, the lack of having a bilingual teacher to facilitate access to academic content, that it was a violation of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 as based on national origin. And secondly, that it was a violation of the Equal Education Protection Clause within the 14th Amendment. But ultimately, when Lau prevailed at the Supreme Court level, and mind you, it went through the federal courts, um, the district federal courts at two different stages and was turned down, was defeated. Um, and it, within the appeal, it went to um, the Supreme Court. But basically, when Lau prevailed, it was unanimous and it was a celebration, but it was only a celebration in the sense that it violated the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It was not considered a violation constitutionally. And so not a lot of people know about that. And when we think about something that's constitutional versus something that's civil rights, constitutional has greater legal strength, right? It's harder it, you'd have to have a constitutional amendment to overturn something, but something that falls within the Civil Rights Act is a little bit more perilous and has what we would call moderate legal strength, which means if Congress wants to do something about it, there's a possibility that it could be done. I don't even want to say that out loud because I don't even want to evoke it as a possibility. Um, but basically, because this has moderate strength, it really relies on people on the ground to give it stronger, a stronger girth and a stronger push. And that's largely in large part in my research of the Chinese American educators and activists, that it really did take the heartbeats of them collectively on the ground um, to really, really evoke um, the spirit of law um, and really um, making it a civil rights issue, but also trying to extend it beyond that. Um, to preservations of, of their language rights. Um, and so I think the thing that I worry about when it's just under the umbrella of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, because it has moderate legal strength, we have seen over the years in the 80s and the 90s, California, Arizona, and Massachusetts with their English only laws, many of which have been abolished or adjusted, but that created you know, significant erosion around the provision of bilingual education for multiple ethno-linguistic communities, including the Cantonese. Um, so erosion is hard to recover from. And then the more contemporary issues with the possible erosion of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and Lao as we know it, is um, the reading bills that are being pushed forward and have tenets within them that uh, require retention if a student isn't re reading by third grade. And in some cases, English learners or multilingual students are included in this provision and do not qualify for an exemption. Um, and so we see how these particular bills, while not overtly say, stating English only, become sort of an abstracted strategy to um, exit kids quickly and to get them in, into gen ed quickly, or I say, get them into to, to the pool so they can do sink or swim more quickly. Um, and so those sorts of things um, are happening more presently. And then thirdly, I would say, um, when we think about civil rights, we have bilingual education converting itself into dual language education, which is a purposeful blending of English majority speakers um, speakers of the minoritized language and perhaps speakers of other minoritized languages that are commingled. But importantly, what we see throughout the nation is more and more dual language is meeting the demands of English majority students while crowding out the rights of multilingual students. And so um, this is referenced by many, um, many in the field as dual language gentrification. And so that is what we call sort of the tinkering, right? It's the creative erosion, but it becomes per pernicious. And because the Civil Rights Act has moderate le legal strength, um, I remain concerned about how far have we come in 50 years and what will the next 50 look like? Yeah, that's a really interesting uh, perspective. I, I guess I hadn't really thought about it from that how the 
while Lau versus Nichols is this really uh, important case in that civil rights fabric, it is being chipped away by these individual policies because of that moderate kind of protection that you talked about. Um, and it is important to recognize both. But like you said, try not to conjure up any attention to the possibility of that. Um, and so we'll just go on to the to the next question, which is, um, so you were on a you were a panelist on a, a webinar commemorating the 50th anniversary uh, anniversary of this case mm -hmm. um, that uh, reflected on issues of advocacy, civil rights, policy and practice implementation, um, which is really where you know those the details are about that that speak to the strength of those policies. Um, the resounding message during this event was that English learners' equitable access to education remains uh, pretty unfulfilled. Um, so can you speak to what needs to happen in the next 50 years and presumably sooner, hopefully, <laughs> to overcome some of the barriers that currently exist? Sure. I mean, I would think that everything that we did in the last 50 years, we should continue doing that, which means continue to advocate for the rights of multilingual students in your districts and communities and in your states. Um, we need to have um, divisions of multilingual education and departments of education. But I think it's important that we extend that beyond just looking at schools. I think that looking at Lao and language rights only from the lens of schools is hugely problematic. Um, that is also a fault line within Brown versus Board of Education that we only looked at what was happening in schools. And so our reliance on schools being the primary engineers of policy, educational policy, in this case, educational slash language policy, when they are the only engineers they problematically reproduce what they're trying to remediate. So um, it's a really tricky trope. And so what I learned in my study, which I'll talk about later, is that people weren't just working in the schools for language rights. They were working in community centers around language rights, looked working in voting rights around language rights, working for language rights within uh, proper employment or underemployment and addressing those issues. So we can't just look at the schools. We have to look at the health sector. We have to look at the food sector, the availability of food. We have to look at schools, but we need to look at governments. We need to look at policy places like New America. Um, we need to be looking um, at systems for voting, including bilingual ballots, how boundaries are drawn for voting um, constituencies. All of that needs to include language rights. And if we are solely looking at the site of the school, we are gonna be sorely disappointed. And in 50 years, we're gonna be talking about the same thing, saying Lao has largely been unfulfilled. And so my call to the field, both research, and it shouldn't just be researchers, it shouldn't just be lawyers, right? It really is all sectors of our society. And so we need to carefully identify what those sectors are, and we need to begin building expertise within those sectors. Um, I think what's hard, in, and I think about my own context and the provision of translation and interpretation in hospitals, is that oftentimes, those are done contractually by a hospital or a healthcare center. They are so busy, it's not a priority. And so they contract it out, they bring it in and they say, see, we're doing language rights, but they're not really unpacking the practices of the medical practitioners, nor the people that are doing the intake, the nurses, you name it. They're not really doing any training around access in their hospitals and their clinics. And so, um, that conversation needs to extend itself beyond just mere contracting out, but engaging in. Um, I'll give you an example of um, a, a hospital here in Indianapolis that has a provision of, of they have this robust um, Burmese community, most of whom speak Karen. They have Karen speakers on sort of speed dial that can come at a moment, moment's notice. 
but they are paid contractually. And so you are paid by the job. So you're paid $100 a job, regardless of how long it takes, right? So $100 a job is not very much if you're to do several interactions per day. So what ends up happening is the Kren speaking person, um, interpreter, basically tries to do as many jobs as they can. And so they're always in a rush, right? And so patients don't always feel like their full repertoire and their full medical needs are being addressed because they've set up an economic model that um, is focused on efficiency. And there is really no connection to the actual care needs. Um, so that's what happens when we do contracting out. So when I talk about language rights, this does not mean that you hire company X. It means that you engage earnestly in those conversations around access and language rights. Yeah, and that's also just like in the hospitals that we see that in schools and district, districts as well, right? When they don't have the staff, the linguistically diverse staff to um, help with enrollment or just you know be on permanent staff they do these contracting out services whether it's like a, a phone line or um, an online kind of um, application which is not this in any you know technically you know they can point to that and say we're providing language access um, but is it really being embedded into the culture and approach of that school or district, not necessarily. And I think that's a really important kind of uh, point to make because a lot of these policies, and, and it, this is often talked about, the it's this is these policies should be looked at not as like the ceiling, but it's like the starting point. <laughs> and so, how do you build from that, right? Uh, it's it's not, and it's also not just a checkbox kind of exercise. It's how do you uh, meaningfully incorporate these policies and protections into the into the school system, community system, or or whatever um, you're you're working on? Yeah, and to add to that, Leslie, you made me think that we may have multilingual provisions that are contracted out um, with a company or a phone line, right? But when you do that, you are more likely to have bilingual provisions under a monoglossic ideology, meaning we don't really have to change. The secretary doesn't have to experience the discomfort of engaging with a family whose first language is not English. And it is through discomfort that grownups, that adults, um, make significant transformations in what they believe and what their ideologies are, which arbitrates what happens with policy implementation. So I really want to critique um, how we contract out these services, because that just suggests that it's sort of business as usual with this contract, right? It should be business um, as unusual and through discomfort. And that hopefully will imbue more of what we would call a heteroglossic um, ideology, something more additive um, and inclusive. Yeah, and only then will you really start to kind of break down that wall or like the, the emphasis on only the school as the place where change needs to happen and really start to connect with the community around that, which is where that kind of the long-term change really happens. Absolutely. And systemic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so just next question that I had for you. Um, during that same webinar, you spoke about how language rights are connected to affirmative action and voting rights and how we can't work on one in isolation. Can you elaborate a bit more about this and how intersectional fields can work together to realize civil rights for students identified as ELs in the U.S. schools? You bet. So that's a great question. So indeed, you know, again, as we were talking earlier, that we can't just look at the site of schools. And during this period of time in the late 60s um, and the early in the mid 70s, as Lao um, was moving through the courts, was eventually adopted, there was so much going on in throughout the country. You know, we are here um, during the civil rights movement and all of the um, social movements that are going on throughout the country. And so we have language rights as manifested through Lau v. Nichols, right? We have affirmative action um, going on. 
And specific to San Francisco, there are affirmative action cases going on about the hiring of um, or the underemployment of many of the Chinese Cantonese within Chinatown, that they were really restricted to being merchants and living um, in difficult conditions, crowded conditions, and also being underpaid. Um, and so affirmative action, the Chinese for affirmative action um, in Chinatown proper addressed that issue head on. They found that Chinese Americans were not represented or underrepresented in the civil sector, such as policemen and firemen. Um, um, and I will say men, because at the time that's how it was constructed. But um, the, it, there was a height requirement of five, seven or higher in order to work as a fire person or a, a, a police person. And what ended up happening is there was a suit that was filed. Um, and also the Chinese for Affirmative Action took to the papers um, locally, um, statewide to say how ridiculous this would be. And if we had a height requirement in China and Shanghai, then all of those buildings would burn down because most of their workforce would be <laughs> under 5'7". And so the Chinese for Affirmative Action worked with um, legal clinics locally to arbitrate um, the lifting of this and for them to look more um, holistically saying, you know, eliminate the height requirement, but more importantly, recognize the multilingual identities that you have present that can help arbitrate poly, um, positive experiences between fire and the police within Chinatown, which at the time was, was dealing with great social unrest. Um, and so that was happening at the same time and very aggressively in multiple sectors, in the hotel sector, in the restaurant sector, in the tourism se sector, and in civil service. And the other thing that was happening is we have, you know, the Voting Rights Act of 1975. Um, that is going on where you see the provision of bilingual ballots um, being required if you had a certain constitution in a given area. And in relationship to voting rights, you also have a lot of critiques happening around the collection during the 1970 census. And in 1969, the Chinese for Affirmative Action in Chinatown, San Francisco, filed a lawsuit against the US census and also took to the papers because they were, for the first time, collecting the census data by mail instead of going door to door. And so in Chinatown, there are many um, what we call SROs, where you have multiple families living in rooms and there are being shared restrooms and kitchen areas, very overcrowded conditions and them only having one address. So if you send something by mail in one address in English to a Chinese speaking um, SRO, you basically are counting one family. It's the first person to pick up the mail. And the first person to pick up the mail does not read English and therefore it is not filled out. So there would be a massive undercount, which would mean that there would be less resources, economic resources to Chinatown. And so the push on that really did change the way it's in which the census was collected. And obviously the census impacts what happens with voting rights and the provisions of things being done in multiple languages. So all of this was happening. I'm somewhat nostalgic. Um, some people would say sort of romanticize this period in time, but this was all happening at the same time. I call it the trifecta. And because of that, um, we can see enormous movements with language rights, affirmative action, voting rights, and how they're all working together. And as I learned from a lot of the participants in my, um, in my project, they were instrumental in not just working on language rights, they were also working on affirmative action and voting rights as well. Yeah, that is a really interesting kind of historical context to think about where at the time that uh, Lau V. Nichols was happening. And I think that in a lot of uh, policy, specifically education policy, it's easy to kind of draw a line or, or to separate, act as if these kids don't have parents and homes and aren't affected by a broader societal policies and discrimination. And I think that when you look at it from that kind of what you're, you know, that kind of triangle that you're, that you were talking about, 
you start to make those connections and how, you know, change in one area really does affect the other. And we can't think of these kids and these students as, you know, these, these silos that live alone, like they live in homes with parents who also speak other languages, who also have needs. And so thinking about it from that perspective, I think is really, really helpful. Yeah. Um, and so just to kind of loop back to um, part of the first question, you're currently writing a book um, on the role that the Chinese American community had on language, language rights before and after the Lao case. What can you tell us about what your research has uncovered? You bet. So yeah, this is a forthcoming book I have with Multilingual Matters and it'll be out in August of 24. It's called Lao v. Nichols and Chinese American Language Rights, The Sunrise and Sunset of Bilingual Education. Um, which takes the arc from the Chinese Exclusion Act, which was from 19, 1882 through uh, 1965, all the way up to the present, and what is the state of Cantonese bilingual education in San Francisco presently. And so it ends with sunset, which is a legal term. Um, San Francisco Unified had a consent decree from 1975 onward because of Lao, um, but that was sunsetted in 2019. Um, very quietly, a lot of people don't know that the decrees ended. It does not mean that they're exempt from um, the tenants of Lao, but it does mean that they're no longer under court supervision. So remember how I talked earlier about erosion and tinkering. Um, I have a concern about that, and that's how the book ends. But to kind of go back to the project, um, of looking at what was the Chinese American community doing in Chinatown proper around language rights. Um, I really frame them as architects um, in the implementation and the development of Lao. Um, I also talked to Edward Steinem, the lead lawyer for um, the Chinese plaintiffs, and Alan Nichols, who at the time was the defendant and the school board president of San Francisco upon Lao's filing. So one of the ways that I approached this um, inquiry is that I did start with talking to some people, but I also dug into the legal briefs. I read all of the original documents. I'm not a lawyer. I haven't been trained in legal language and legal discourse, and I found myself um, to be feeling like a language learner because I was encountering all this um, discourse that was really unfamiliar to me. So I put those documents to the side and I began um, interviewing people um, within the Chinese community, including um, the Chinese American Teachers of San Francisco Unified, um, the Chinese for Affirmative Action. Um, I also looked at primary doc documents other than legal briefs, including the Chinatown newspapers, uh, board minute meetings, bilingual community council meetings, dissertation studies written by Chinatown scholars, and also the minutes um, and the newsletters from the Association for Chinese Teachers. And so what I would do is I would take these documents that were locally generated and created, and I would use those when I would interface with the participants so that they could remember, refine, redirect, and say, that's what we wrote down, but this is what ended up happening, or we wrote that down because this did happen. And so what I found is that there were different perspectives. So if I looked at the Chronicle or the Examiner of San Francisco, the narrative was really different relative to the Chinatown narrative. So I was very, very focused on really bounding this, the, the inquiry um, distinctly to the Chinese American community. Um, the participants that were Chinese American um, were teachers and activists. And I would say that um, almost all of them grew up in Chinatown and were regarded uh, and identify as American born Chinese. And they attended San Francisco Unified during the time where there was no ESL or bilingual education. They were in sink or swim situations and their teachers were mostly white and female and they prohibited the use of Chinese um, on the playground. They even sometimes prohibited them from speaking their variety of English that had what many called a Chinatown accent. Um, and at the same time, their parents were telling them, their immigrant Chinese parents would tell them, respect and obey your teachers. And so there was this 
complicated matrix as they were trying to negotiate what does my teacher need or want or demand and that I need to respect them. At the same time, my parents are telling me, go to Chinese school after school every day, six days a week. And most of my Chinese American participants did so. And so there was this matrix of, I got to figure out what to be at school and how to behave and how to express myself in language at school. And then I have to think about how do I behave when I go to after um, my after school Chinese program in Cantonese. So um, I think the other thing to point out with my participant is they attended schools in relative isolation in Chinatown. This is before busing. And so as they were growing up in the 50s and 60s, um, when they started going to middle school and high school, they were suddenly outside of Chinatown and really going to school with white, black, and brown children. And so they were very um, surprised and shocked to be out of their Chinatown enclave um, and had to negotiate what that meant for them. Um, and then many went on to study at San Francisco State University, becoming church teachers, and they were even further surprised when they got outside of Chinatown, where they were regarded as well-performing students, that their English was not regarded as standard. One of my participants even had to get speech therapy um, because he had a Chinatown accent. He's very intelligible, but he was regarded as having an accent. And if he was to be a teacher, he needed to have an elite form of English and therefore had to succumb to speech services, you know, as, as a 20 year old at, at college. Um, I think the other important thing for my study is the Chinese activism that was going on um, in tandem with all of the uh, student movements. So as many attended um, San Francisco State um, during the time that the Third World Liberation Front was very active, which was asking and demanding um, ethnic studies programs and is the longest standing student strike in our nation's history. Um, and as a result of that, there is a very robust Asian American ethnic studies program along with every other ethnic studies program, um, uh, black studies programs, Latino study program that are very active at this university because of that. Um, but the activism was also supported by um, Brown versus Board of Education and the giving of funding to Chinatown to help with social programs, which many of them were a part. And of course, we can't forget about the Bilingual Education Act of 1964 and its subsequent uh, revisions in the 70s. This afforded dollars to be able to scale bilingual education in Cantonese and English in schools but it also gave the opportunity to the Chinese educators to go on and get their doctorates at nearby universities as funded by Title VII within the Bilingual Education Act. So many of my participants who again grew up in Chinatown, went on to serve their schools mostly in Chinatown, went on to become PhDs. And um, many of them went on to serve at the university level, preparing future teachers to be Cantonese uh, teachers and provide those bilingual provisions within their communities. Um, and others went on to remain in the system and be principals and leaders and activists um, throughout San Francisco where as the Chinese community was expanding. But I think the principal thing is, is that all of them drew from their historic um, and current and complicated identities with language, race, and national origin. And they drew from that, and that helped them determine and arbitrate what was language policy going to look like for the students in my classroom, in my bilingual classroom? What is it going to look like when I am now a principal? What is it going to look like now that I'm a, you know, a principal, maybe in a school with many Chinese students outside of Chinatown? Or what will it look like for me as a principal in a community where there are very few Chinese students? And so all of them brought those experiences to the fore to arbitrate the ways in which they enacted policy and how they interpreted Lau v. Nichols, right? And the notion of it being under the Civil Rights Act or the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, right? That's not really what they talk up, talked about. That's what lawyers and policy people typically talk about, but they talked about this is what happened um, on the ground.
Wow, I can't wait to read that book. And also, it sounds like they, the participants themselves, were kind of writing a book in present time as well, because they were advocating and changing, but also benefiting from these policies to advance themselves, but also with like an eye to the future about what, you know, they would want to be available for their own students. I think that is such an interesting, like they were, they were doing and living at the same time and kind of pushing that line. Um, that is a really interesting um, perspective to hear. Um, and I think a more positive um, perspective too on this. And when we talk about, you know, what has happened in the last 50 years, I think when you look at it from that angle, you can see that a lot of positive change has, has happened. Um, and um, it does give me a lot of hope <laughs> for what can come in the next 50 years. Yeah, although we are still seeing a lot of, you know, that the conflicting messages between schools and homes uh, for these students is still happening. Um, they are still getting those kind of mixed messages that are really affecting their sense of self and their identity. And so, you know, that continues to be a struggle today, um, even, even 50 years on. Um, so the work is definitely um, not done. It's not uh, done. No, so that, so that really concludes um, our chat for today. Um, and I just really wanna thank you, Trish, for being here and sharing your perspective as a scholar in this issue area and thank anybody who is watching today.